Good morning, or good afternoon, whenever it is. Thank you for your interest in the class and for joining us today. We're going to be looking today at the development of monasticism, which is extremely important as far as the Middle Ages are concerned. And it becomes a community where the focus is simply on Christ and living the Christian life. We're also going to look at the beginning of the papacy, just to see where we stand at this point and where we're going. Thank you again for joining us. I sincerely hope and pray everything that is said is true as best I can make it and uh, that you are blessed and benefited by the class. Of course, we, above everything else, we pray that God will receive the glory. So let's join the study at this point. We're finding our roots. I'm going to call this the sources of theology. And notice the bottom, as the ancient classical world ends and the early medieval age begins. Now, here are seven paths of uh, development of, of theology that we've been following. And the blue that you see there indicates the sources that have been most important in defining these and helping us to understand, for instance, who is Christ? We looked at that last week with the seven ecumenical councils. What must one do to be saved? What's the true church? And there, um, St. Augustine is of considerable value. Sacraments and worship were addressed by the fathers, as were these other categories. How should the Christian live? Who is God? What is the source of knowledge and authority? And whether it be the early uh, letter writers uh, of the first century, the second century apologists who defended Christianity to its uh, enemies, and the third century polemicists who answered the threat of, of heresy. These were the occasions for these definitions in these various categories. And going forward, we shall see that the, the theologians in the early Middle Ages will build upon this foundation. Now, again, to get a perspective, because 500 is a, a critical year, but we've noticed also 325 is a critical year. And that was the Council of Nicaea. We've talked before about the fathers, the four categories, the fathers of the East and the fathers of the West, and the fathers before Nicene Council and afterwards. These uh, fathers, as we call them, were scholars, many of them well-educated people who became Christians. Now the early fathers, the anti-Nicene fathers, most of whom were bishops of churches, will rely on the Holy Scriptures as authority. And they were very um, adamant about that. And they supported, they buttressed their view of the Holy Scriptures as authority by tradition and succession. In other words, as time went on, they looked to the tradition uh, of the apostles and the early church before them as uh, an interpretation, a commentary of the scriptures, and also succession. This is that uh, chain, so to speak. But remember that the earliest fathers knew the apostles. Uh, it may well be that Clement worked with Paul and some of them were converted by John. And so there was this link and they, they saw that as a way, again, of maintaining the authority of the scriptures. They, their concern was to represent accurately what the apostles taught. Now, after 325, when the Emperor Constantine became a Christian and the various problems arose, his method and the method of those who succeeded him was to call councils. And the first one, of course, to deal with the question, is Jesus really divine and of the same essence as the Father? And uh, these councils continue to be called. We looked at the seven ecumenical councils last week. And out of that, we find creeds developing, particularly first the Nicene Creed, and then the creed as it was modified at Constantinople in 381, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. And uh, that creed is called the symbol of the fathers. Then we see patriarchs as the hierarchy develops, patriarchs developing five patriarchs. They were really archbishops, but they took the title of patriarch and they were considered the highest authority in the church. And many of them were theologians. 
And uh, then we're going to see, beginning in 450, popes uh, taking their place. And I'm going to talk about in just a moment the rise of monks and the important role that they will play. We're still trying to see how the doctrines of Christianity were defined and how they come to um, take the shape of the various denominational beliefs of today. Now, one other comment before we leave this slide. After the seven ecumenical councils, the theology in the East was largely fixed. Very little change after that. And that East part of Christianity is known as the area where the Orthodox Church dominates. And you see that in this map. You'll notice that uh, there are five patriarchs, um, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople. Those four are in the East. And the only one in the West is Rome. And that's the way the church was divided East and West. And now to monasticism. You will notice that uh, the mottos of monasticism, these, these are the vows that monks took, a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. The monks became heroes of society in early medieval Europe. They uh, performed most of the functions of many modern institutions. They've performed most of the functions of the preceding Roman Empire after the collapse of the Roman Empire. For instance, they provided legal services, wills and contracts. They provided benevolent services. They took care of uh, indigent people and orphans and widows. They provided schools. They kept libraries. They copied manuscripts. They were the educational source. They provided counseling services. They, on their lands, grew crops and kept vineyards and became experts in husbandry. They were agricultural experts. And they provided the banks, the only banks that were available, and crafts and small manufacturing and commercial services. They did the things that uh, were, were done by various uh, institutions and businesses in the Roman Empire, which were defunct, were gone by 500. They represented, at the same time, the ideals of Christianity and particularly escaping from the sin of the world. They understood worldliness. They saw the world as it was. They, they were Christians and they saw the evil and the sin that was rampant in the world, the violence, the hatred, and they wanted a way of escape. Now, perhaps we say, well, that's not what Christ taught. We are to be in the world, not of the world, but that was their answer. And they saw that as a way of living close to God, but still, still, influencing society. They led disciplined and pious lives. Now, we have noticed that the doctrines, as they come to be defined, were defined usually because of some type of uh, conflict, uh, some confrontation of false doctrine, and, and thus they were defined to establish true doctrine in answer to heresy. Now, the same thing really is true here. When they perceive the sin of the world and the conflict between the values they held as Christians and the fallen world, their answer was to escape from the fallen world and to be with Christ and to live a Christian life. So it is a result of a perceived crisis. Also, one might say it represented the Platonic ideas of escaping from the physical. Platonists considered that the physical is, is identified with evil and so spiritual with uh, good. Uh, and thus the monks were known as regular clergy, regular clergy, because they followed a regula, that's Latin for rule, they had a rule. Uh, that is, of course, poverty, chastity, and obedience, and that rule was expanded in various uh, different monastic groups. Now, on the other hand, the pastors, the priests, the bishops who served out with the people were called secular clergy. And for women, uh, they formed convents and became known as the nuns. Now, although the founders, as we shall see, the founders of the monastic movement lived in the classical or ancient period, that is the period before 500, monasticism flourished in the medieval period. Now, the founder 
is St. Anthony, and he did live, as you see, a long time. He came from the East, and the East is generally more ascetic, denying of the flesh. He was an Egyptian who had wealthy parents, and he had a substantial inheritance. But when he studied scripture, he was particularly impressed by what Jesus told the rich young ruler. Go, sell what you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And so his response was to go out into the desert by himself and live in a cemetery where he could ponder the scriptures and pray. He claimed that he learned from an old man who taught him much about being a Christian. He fasted. And then he claimed to have had visions of demons, as you see in the illustration on the right. And he retreated farther into the desert and lived in an old fort. While he was there, some young monks came to talk with him. Now, they are monks because they've heard of Antony. He's the first of them. And the idea became extremely popular. And these young people wanted to escape from the world. So they came out to talk with their master, so to speak, their leader. And he did talk with them until he later insisted on being alone. I want to be totally isolated, totally alone. So he left the desert only on two occasions. Those two occasions were visits to Alexandria. And both times he went there to express his opposition to the heresy of Arianism, thus to affirm the Trinity. And on one of those occasions, he attended the Council of Nicaea. Uh, obviously in the company of Athanasius, who was the uh, president uh, presiding over that council. And uh, it was Athanasius who wrote a biography of him, The Life of St. Anthony. And that started a tradition of writing of biographies of saints known as hagiographies. Now, St. Anthony's form of monasticism was very sterile, very um, isolated, and yet he began the movement and drew attention to this ascetic, dedicated life. Now, the next monk of importance is Paul the Hermit. Very little is known of him. Only we know of him through the writings of Jerome. He's sometimes called St. Paul the First Hermit. He was among the earliest of the desert fathers. But... He is famous chiefly for the visit made to him by St. Anthony. So we all often see him portrayed with Anthony. Now, according to what Jerome wrote about Paul the Hermit, a raven brought the two saints, that is Anthony and Paul, a loaf of bread. And St. Paul explained to his guests that it usually brought just half a loaf. But at your coming, Christ has doubled his soldiers' rations, he told him. Now, a year later, St. Jerome says, Antony returned to find St. Paul dead. He buried him with the help of two lions who pawed a hole in the ground for a grave. Thus, some portraits show St. Paul standing between two lions, or a pair of tigers. The next monk of great importance is Pacomius, 290 to 345. And it is interesting in the short length of time, there was there's this mass exodus to the desert to follow Antony's example. So many people uh, realized uh, that the world was evil and this was the way for them to uh, escape that. People sought to live simple lives and to avoid this developing hierarchy, which they considered to be secular. Now, Pacomius, different from Antony, he had a pagan background. And uh, as a young man, he was uh, drafted into the army, forced to join the Roman army. He didn't like that. And while he was in the army, he met some Christians who showed him great kindness, and that led to his conversion. Pacomius went to the desert and prayed to God for guidance. Claims that an angel told him to serve God. And so he founded a community. Uh, that is uh, a group of people coming together and living together, devoted to prayer, study of scripture, contemplation, discipline, useful work, a daily ritual. They shaved their heads in a, a sign that indicated they had taken the vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience called the tonsure. 
and they were together involved in mutual service. Now these communities were called, uh, we call this Cenobitic monasticism, community monasticism. His sister Mary established an order for women and the monasteries began to build buildings and grew exponentially. They became a complex of buildings. Now, Jerome mentioned him a moment ago, 342 to 342, uh, 420, excuse me. Uh, he is most known for translating the Latin Bible, uh, translating the, the scriptures into Latin. That translation is known as the Vulgate because it was the common Latin of the day. And that Vulgate translation was the official uh, translation of the Bible into Latin, for official Latin Bible for the Roman Catholic Church until not too many years ago. Jerome also wrote biblical commentaries and histories and biographies. Again, these hagiographies. Um, he was into also was into science, into homeopathy. That is, uh, things like uh, vitamins that he would recommend. And he was extremely moral. Uh, and, and, and very critical of immorality in the clergy and in women, very harsh in his criticism. And he is the most voluminous writer after St. Augustine. He's primarily a scholar, but I think he's interested, it would seem, in so many categories. Now, uh, he was never a monk. However, and I've listed him with monks because he established a monastery and he lived in the desert for a while. But he's primarily a Bible scholar. And uh, I remember reading uh, his uh, comments on translation. And he said, I use a sense for sense approach. You get the sense of the passage from the original. And then as he puts it into Latin, he puts it in, in a, a more contemporary uh, uh, and understandable way, sense for sense, as opposed to just word for word. But this is also interesting. And I will pass it on as a theological uh, comment here. He taught that one could not advance in Holy Scriptures without an experienced guide to show the way. And he used as an example the eunuch saying to Philip, how could I understand except someone guide me? So an experienced guide is needed to understand the Scriptures correctly and to avoid heresy. But he said the Scripture is such that the learned and the unlearned can gain from it. So he encouraged everybody to study, but he said, we should study here on earth the knowledge that will continue with us in heaven. So everybody can learn, everybody should learn, but you do need experienced teachers. He wrote extensively on the Christian life. And as I said, he took a very strict view. And he was classed among the four Latin doctors doctor meaning teacher, the great teachers. Thus, uh, the ones in the West who spoke Latin, uh, historians and theologians later tended to identify four as being the greatest. Of course, St. Augustine. Secondly, Ambrose, we've talked about him. Gregory the First, about whom we shall speak in a few moments, and Jerome. And then Basel is extremely important in the development of monasticism. He is the most important monastic leader in the East. He served as Archbishop of Caesarea. What did he add? Social concern. He was concerned about reaching out and helping people, thus providing medical help, hospitals, uh, taking care of children, orphanages, doing good to fellow men, benevolent work, Thus, his was a complete communal life, making work honorable. This is the, uh, the ultimate uh, development of monasticism. Now, monasticism was very strong in the East before it was in the West. We'll see the West in a moment, but particularly in the East. Monks were free from persecution or taxation. By 390, there were 12,000 monks. And some of them were extreme, and movements often develop their extreme uh, uh, characteristics, and that's 
true with monasticism. Uh, some people would think it's holy to go out and graze in the field, eat, eat grass like a cow. And then there were the pillar sitters, uh, like St. Simon Stilates, who went up to the top of a pillar and remained there for 20 years. But uh, that extreme ascetic form was not characteristic of most monks. Well, we've already talked about Pelagius. Come back just to mention he was a monk from Britain, from Ireland. And uh, next week, I wanted us to focus on Britain, Christianity, and the church coming to Britain. He was, as you remember, the proponent of the free will doctrine uh, and very ascetic, very concerned about morality and believing that if you taught grace, that was just a license to sin, taught that man was born with a blank slate, he's neutral, can go either way, the sin of Adam affected no one but Adam, and therefore salvation was a matter of a man making uh, correct uh, free will choices and good works. And you remember John Cashin, also a monk, also ascetic, a theologian and a founder of the and first abbot of the famous Abbey of Saint Victor at Marseille. And, and his doctrine, he maintained that after the fall, there still remained in every soul, quote, some seeds of goodness implanted by the kindness of the Creator, which, however, must be quickened by the assistance of God, that is, that island of righteousness uh, in every human heart. And uh, John Cassian's view will be extremely important. Uh, in the development of Christianity. It later will be the concept ad adopted by Ar Arminians. Then Martin of Tours, uh, he was born around 316, 397. He comes from Hungary. He is the Bishop of Tours in France. And he also founded uh, a community of hermits, a, a monastery of hermits at uh, Liturgie, and that was the first in Gaul. Gaul is France today. And outside Tours, he founded another monastery, Marmoutier, uh, to which he withdrew whenever possible. Now, noticing this uh, diagram here, uh, and this information explaining it, he was born in 335 in Hungary. His father was a pagan. He became a Christian and a soldier. In Amiens, he gave half of his cape to a beggar. And he later had a vision of Christ wearing that cape in the chapel. Subsequently, he became the Bishop of Tours. And with him, the idea developed that monks provide the standard of living for bishops. Bishops should be like monks. Now, Patrick, we celebrated uh, St. Patrick's Day uh, last week. Uh, he is in the fifth century. His dates are not particularly known. There are only two surviving works, his declaration, in Latin it's confessio, and uh, the letter to the soldiers of Carocius. He was the missionary from the Celtic church in England to the pagans in Ireland. Remember his story, he, as a young man, a teenager, he was kidnapped by pirates and made a slave, and taken to uh, Ireland, enslaved, and later escaped, went back to England, but decided he should return to Ireland to uh, convert, to help convert the Irish to Christ. And then there is Rufinus of Aquileia. Uh, he was 344 to 411. Um, he had a very unusual theory. I pass it on to you, not <laughs> that anybody else held it, but it's kind of interesting. It was the mousetrap or fish hook theory of the atonement. Very strange. His belief was that Satan held humanity cap captive so securely that God was unable to liberate them by legal means. So this plan was developed that the humanity of Christ would be a bait to catch Satan and the divinity of Christ was the hook. So he came as a man tempting Satan, believing he could destroy the man Christ, and taking the hook, he found that he could not. Thus, Satan was trapped by his humanity. I don't know of anyone else that took up that particular theory. Now, theological leadership also comes from patriarchs. Uh, for instance, Cyril of Jerusalem. He was Bishop of Jerusalem, 348 to 387. What he contributed is interesting. He contributed the idea of the importance of creeds. 
in presenting the one teaching of the faith in its totality. And here's what he said about it. As a mustard seed contains a great number of branches in its tiny grain, so this summary of faith brings together in a few words the entire knowledge of the true religion which is contained in the old and new. And you see that that concept indeed developed. And then there was Gregory of Nazianzus. He was a patriarch of Constantinople, and he was a great speaker. Uh, he was a great defender of the doctrine of the Trinity and of what was by this time defined as little o orthodox Christianity. He contributed this thought, the gradual re revelation of the Trinity. He taught, you study the Old Testament, and it, it develops the doctrine of the Father openly. Study the New Testament, and it revealed the Son. But the Spirit dwells in us and is more clearly revealed to us in us as the Spirit dwells with us. Interesting theory. And then John Chrysostom, Patriarch of Constantinople, prolific writer, one of the great uh, post-Nicene fathers, a powerful preacher who had the courage to stand up to immorality in the imperial court to the emperor and the empress, and he denounced their uh, conduct when it was contrary to that of Christ. Well, he got exiled for doing that, but he was a very courageous and capable preacher. Even an emperor, Zeno, uh, got into theology. He issued the Henoticon to affirm the definition of Chalcedon and to end monophysite controversy. He wasn't too successful at that. Now, of course, uh, mentioned earlier the papacy. It, it, it comes along in the middle of the fifth century. It begins with Leo I. Now, here's the situation, uh, the rationale for the papacy. Many of the fathers, including Irenaeus and Cyprian and St. Augustine, saw the need for a centralized organization to prevent disunity among Christians, to protect the church from heresy. They thought it would be needful to, to have a more centralized uh, authority and it, to preserve basic truths by maintaining unity in the church. And so they pointed to Rome as an exemplary church uh, to provide this centralized authority. Rome at this time, at the time of uh, these fathers listed above in the fifth century, uh, had 46 priests, seven deacons, seven subdeacons, 98 minor officials had a large staff. They supported 1,500 widows and needy people, and they were known for their good organization and their morals and, and their mercies uh, extended to people in need. And yet, th what these fathers were emphasizing and others who followed them up to 450, what they were emphasizing was Rome can provide uh, leadership, can provide a centralized organization, but none of them specifically mentioned a papacy. Now, as far as Constantinople is concerned and the relationship between Rome and Constantinople, the emperor in Constantinople regarded himself as the head of the church, but he did recognize the primacy of Rome. In other words, Rome was the first among equals, so to speak, but the emperor in Constantinople had the real power. Uh, Rome could provide centralization and unity, but the authority came from the emperor. And his doctrine was Caesaropapism, that is that the Caesar, the emperor, is the pope. Because, remember, the emperor had the office of Pontifex Maximus, high priest, to uh, obtain the Pax Deorum, peace of the gods, now Pax Christi, peace of Christ. So it, it was a consensus among the fathers that the highest cleric was the Patriarch of Constantinople. And the other patriarchs, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome were recognized, but they were still looking to Rome uh, to provide some uh, uh, unity and some organization in the West. Now, Constantinople never officially recognized the claim of the Roman bishop to rule universally over the church. And to this day, the Orthodox Christians do not recognize the authority of the Pope, but they tacitly recognized his power and influence. 
Well, it was Leo the first who first declared himself to be the universal papa, the universal pope. And just as we have seen throughout uh, this study, it was a crisis that precipitated a reaction. And we saw the crisis of the sacking of Rome in 410 by the Visigoths. And that uh, occasioned the writing of the City of God by St. Augustine. But there were more and more barbarian invasions seeking to take over Rome. And one of them came from Attila the Hun, as he was conquering more and more territory. And uh, in 451, uh, Leo turned back Attila the Hun. Now, he went outside Rome and talked to him. We do not know what he said exactly. There are speculations. But he claimed that the fact that Attila turned back and did not sack Rome was a sign from God that he should be recognized as the head of the entire church on earth, which he claimed. And he backed it up with a scripture, Matthew 16, 18, which has been known and is known today as the Petrine Thesis. It's based on this passage in Matthew 16. He, Jesus, said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And uh, thus his conclusion is Peter was the first pope. I am pope, and I have the authority that, that Peter had, uh, as Jesus defined in Matthew 16. Now, was Peter in Rome? Well, Leo said, if you look at 1 Peter 5, he refers to Babylon. Peter says, those in Babylon greet you. And the idea was, that, well, that's Rome. But Paul never mentioned him among those in the church in Rome when he sent greetings in Romans 16 to the members of the church in Rome. And Luke never mentioned him in connection with Rome in his history in the book of Acts. But the Petrine thesis claims that Peter was the first bishop of Rome and the head of the church and the authority he had was passed down through that office. Yet, Eusebius of Caesarea, the early historian, and Irenaeus, the father, say that Linus was the first bishop of Rome. And many scholars believe that the church at Rome was governed by a college of bishops. Now, Leo refused to accept the superiority of the Patriarch of Constantinople. And to add to this uh, incident with Attila the Hun, there was another uh, danger from uh, the um, Germans, and, and this was Geiseric the Vandal in 455. Uh, he did do some damage in Rome, but Leo negotiated a peace with him and he withdrew. So, again, a sign from God. There were Hereafter, the history of the papacy is the story of how the Bishop of Rome assumed power and dominated lands and nations. He the, became the first Bishop of Rome to claim universal sovereignty over the church and no other Christian Bishop has ever presumed to do this. Now, after Leo, the papacy that he established was weak. And we come now to the year 500 and what we would think is a demarcation, uh, an end of the ancient period and the beginning of what is known as the early Middle Ages. Now, before, uh, in the apostolic age and in the age of the fathers, in the age of the councils and the church leaders up to 500, the period we've been looking at, this was an extremely fruitful period in defining, refining, analyzing, synthesizing Christian doctrine. Now, after 500, we see the emphasis on missionary activity, on expanding the church throughout Europe, which will be done in that 500 year period. And we see the monastic contributions, the importance of the monasteries in preserving the Bible, scriptures, copying manuscripts. It's a great time of preaching. 
and is productive in scholarship in terms of building on the theological accomplishments of the first 500 years. Now, we say 500. That doesn't mean that people went to bed on December 31st, 499, and said this is the last day of the ancient classical period, and woke up the next morning on January the 1st, 500, and said this is the beginning of the Middle Ages. It was a gradual process, but I think you can see how we can use that 500 as a point of demarcation. For instance, in 378, the Roman army, for the first time since uh, the empire was established, was defeated by the Goths at Adrianople. In 381, as we have seen, Theodosius, the emperor, made Christianity the only legal religion and closed the pagan venues, including the Olympic Games and the temples, the Delphic Oracle, and all of that. So you're seeing Rome going down and Christianity coming up. 392, Theodosius began the persecution of pagans, which we saw no doubt related to the uh, irritation of the pagans and claiming that the, that the Christians were responsible for the sacking of Rome in 410. In 406, the Roman army just packed up and went home and abandoned Britain. And 410, of course, was the year that uh, Alaric the Visigoth sacked Rome and thus St. Augustine wrote the City of God. In 450, as we have seen, Attila the Hun threatened Rome and Leo I turned him back and proclaimed himself to be Pope. In 476, the Roman government, the Western Roman Empire collapsed when it was conquered by Odovacar the Goth. In 493, the Ostrogoths conquered all of Italy. And crossing over the 500 point, in 529, the Emperor Justinian closed the classical schools at Athens, that is the schools of Plato and Aristotle, the Academy of Plato, the Lyceum of Aristotle, and with that, really, the ancient world was dead and gone. That's, those were the last remaining vestiges of uh, antiquity. And in the same year, in 529, Western monasticism was off to a great start with St. Benedict establishing the monastery of Monte Cassino. What's the difference? The classical period, especially under the Romans, the Romans had a strong economy. Uh, they had a, a money economy, used money in exchange. Trade was very strong. They were located, people lived in towns and cities, so it's an urban civilization. And the government provided services uh, that made life uh, comfortable and, and allowed progress. And interestingly enough, until the third century, they had low taxes. They had institutions like banks and hospitals and schools. And they also had sports venues, and entertainment venues. So it was a very sophisticated, developed civilization, and yet it collapsed. Then the early Middle Ages came. Rome is gone in the West. It's a rural, agricultural-based society with no money. Money is gone. People were living on self-sufficient manners out in the country, living as serfs uh, under a lord serving him. And the only institutions available to them would be the local church, which usually was on the, the manor, and monasteries. Now, during that period, a great pope arose in the West, Gregory I, 590 to 604. And we say the medieval papacy truly begins with Gregory. And, and he fits in with the uh, feudal uh, medieval society. He was a, a secular ruler. He was wealthy. He was a confidant of kings. He started with a career in politics as prefect or mayor of Rome, became a monk in 574, and then was sent by the Pope as an ambassador to Constantinople, where he learned about politics in Constantinople. Now, he was highly moral. He distrusted the world, and he feared sin. Thus, he fits with the monastic uh, mentality. And Rome, the city of Rome, was in very sad condition in the late 6th century. Now, he came with political and diplomatic experience by being the ambassador to Constantinople. He was a Roman official before he was a monk. And then, as Pope, very much interested in uh, conversion of Europe, 
He sent a monastery to England. We'll talk about that next week. The, there's a story that may be true. He uh, went into the marketplace in Rome where they were selling slaves. The slavery was still uh, being practiced. And there were some young boys being sold as slaves. They were uh, very fair, blonde hair, uh, very uh, beautiful boys. And he said to his servant, he said, who are these boys? And the servant said, well, sir, they are Angles, you know, like Angles, Anglo-Saxons. And he said, no, I think rather they're not Angles, but angels, play on words. And he said to his servant, are they Christians? Do they know the Lord? And the servant said, no, sir, they are pagans. He said, well, we have to convert them. And so he sent a man named Augustine. Now, this is not St. Augustine. That's one reason we pronounce the names with different uh, accents on different syllables. This uh, Augustine is a missionary to England to convert uh, England to Christianity. Uh, now, he took over the political, that is Gregory did, the political rule of, of Rome, and he was an excellent ruler. Uh, Rome was besieged now, once again, this time by another German group, the Lombards, and he was very capable in handling Rome. But he was reluctant to be made Bishop of Rome after the death of the previous Pope. And this is interesting. He did not want universal sovereignty. He didn't want the power. He didn't want the title of Pope. Very humble person. And he handled the government of Rome very capably in a very difficult time. He helped to convert the Visigothic king of Spain to Trinitarian views because he was an Arian. He tried to intervene in the Donatist controversy in North Africa, unsuccessfully, but he tried. And he worked to encourage high morality in the church, encouraging monks to be faithful to their vows. And he also was a prolific writer. He was in agreement with St. Augustine in his doctrines, but he changed some of the emphasis. For instance, he developed the idea of purgatory, people paying for their sins after death. He emphasized penance over predestination and grace. He believed in grace, but he emphasized penance. And he developed the views that the communion would be the literal body and blood of Christ that led to transubstantiation. And he's most well known, probably, for writing and collecting songs which we know as Gregorian chants. The Church of San Gregorio Magno today stands on the grounds of Gregory's family estate, which he turned into a church. And that old house is still standing on that property. And after Gregory's time, the papacy declined. Now, just to mention Columba, uh, he was an Irish abbot in the early Middle Ages who became a missionary to Scotland. And I read something that said that he had uh, to do with laying the groundwork for Presbyterianism in Scotland. There are three surviving early medieval Latin hymns that are attributed to Columba. He studied at the monastic school. Do you see how the monasteries are providing education by this time? At uh, Movilla and Clonard, and was located later at the monastery of Iona, the famous monastery of Iona. He copied 300 books and wrote extensively. And at the end of his life, he returned to Ireland and founded the monastery of Duro. And then Benedict of Nursia. I mentioned how this would, monasticism would develop in the West and it was due to Benedict of Nursia. He established the Benedictine rule in 529, the same year that Justinian closed the classical schools at Athens, he founded the monastery at Monte Cassino, which became the standard for Western monasticism and a model for all future orders. This is a picture of the monastery of Monte Cassino. It was destroyed in World War II, but rebuilt. That becomes the model for all new orders as new monastic orders are established, which they will be, always with the goal of getting back to the model of the early church, of restoring apostolic Christianity in purity and in service. And in doing so, they always used the rule of the Benedictines as a model, as a template, and continued the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Next week, we'll turn to England, 
and look at the development of the church there. Thank you for joining us in the study today. I certainly hope it's been profitable for you. Uh, it, it's a, a t critical time as we enter into the Middle Ages, and we're going to see some really great scholars coming in the Middle Ages, uh, and monasticism, monasticism playing a vital role. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I do hope you have a blessed week.